Hi, we're Josh and Arielle Wamsley, owners of Green Valley Tree LLC, based in North Wyndham. We're proud to sponsor Connecticut East this week and to serve the communities of Wyndham and New London counties with our tree removal and plant health care services. Visit our website at greenvalleytreeworks.com for a full list of our services or give us a call on 860-234-4041. We look forward to hearing from you. They're part of a small collection of estuaries across the nation where fresh water from the land mixes with salt water from the sea. We talk exclusively to the Connecticut National Estuarine Research Reserve about their work. Plus, we take a look at other stories making the headlines from around the region. This is Connecticut East This Week. Hello, I'm Brian Scott-Smith. In our continuing coverage for National Ocean Month, we sat down with a new organisation in the state whose mission is to look after more than 50,000 acres of marsh, upland and open water in Long Island Sound, Fishers Island Sound and the Lower Connecticut and Thames Rivers. They're called the Connecticut National Estuarine Research Reserve, providing essential habitats for wildlife, offering educational opportunities for students, teachers and the public, and serving as a living laboratory for scientists. I spoke with Larissa Graham, Educational Coordinator for the Reserve, and Jamie Vaudry, the Reserve's Research Coordinator. To you both, thank you ever so much for joining us on Connecticut East this week. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us. So we have mentioned... The Connecticut National Estuarine Research Reserve. It's a very big, long title. (laughs) Sounds fabulous. Let me turn to you first, Jamie. What is this organization? Because it's new to us. The Connecticut Reserve is the 30th in a nationwide system. It's a NOAA program. So NOAA supports the National Estuarine Research Reserve System. The reserves are located in coastal states and on the Great Lakes. They started, I want to say, in the in the 1970s with this program. We're very happy to be the 30th reserve in the system. 30? That's a small number of very specialized organizations, isn't yeah. it? Tell us a little bit more about that because that's almost like an exclusive club. Yeah, it is an exclusive club. We call it our nerdy family, though. NER is, or NERS is what we call the reserve system, the N-E-R-R. And it more than an exclusive club, it is literally like joining a family. The reserves across the nation collaborate. They support each other, are very welcoming. We have frequent meetings to, to get together, and it's just been immensely supportive joining this system. More so than, you know, other scientific societies that I've been part of, it's even more than that, very welcoming and friendly. The reserves themselves are generally coastal. We include the Great Lakes, even though they're freshwater, they are included as part of our estuarine family because they're large and they have some of the characteristics of seas. But most of the reserves are along coast. The early reserves focus largely on marshes, but now we have reserves that have more water in them. In fact, our reserve is mostly water. We have 50,000 acres of water in our reserve and only about 2,000 acres of land. The reserve system, though, extends down into the subtropical region, so there are mangroves as well, coral reefs, and going out to Hawaii, you know, it's a, a beautiful mangrove coral reef area up to Alaska, so... Let's bring Larissa in at this point. Larissa, you're the education coordinator yes. for the reserve. Tell us a little bit about your job because, again, I mean, it, the whole thing is fascinating. Yeah. It's all about the environment. It's about, you know, our natural world. It's so, so important. So to know that we've got, you know, this amazing new organization here in Connecticut is, is obviously phenomenal. But tell us a little bit about, you know, some of the work that you're going to be doing as part of, you know, getting that education out there. Yeah, reserves focus on four different topics, so research, stewardship, education, and then coastal training. And so as you said, I'm the education coordinator. So what I do is I take all the research and share it with people. So a lot of the audiences that we'll be working with are community members, but then also 
educators and students. So there's so many exciting opportunities. So, so much of the research that Jamie's going to be doing can be shared with students. They can be involved in the process. They can use the data and figure out trends and see what's changing in the reserve. And so lots of exciting opportunities. And then also we have opportunities for community members to access the Long Island Sound. So again, Jamie mentioned like the 50,000 acres that is part of the reserve. Also those land areas and to help out with some of the research. So for example, we're going to hopefully be doing some like horseshoe crab monitoring. We'll do some beach cleanups, eventually probably some invasive species, so invasive plant removal at some of our sites. So lots of opportunities for people to be involved and really, I think, connect to the reserve. When you talk about, you know, students, are you also talking about sort of this sort of information, maybe trying to be getting it into the curriculum for schools as well? I mean, you know, because I don't think we really so like learn enough, do we, at, at any age, unless yeah. we then decide to go on and specialise in something, yeah. which is a real shame because it's all around us. We should be looking mm-hmm. after this. We should know more about it. Yeah. So I think that there are a lot of organisations that are, you know, they have their own curriculums. They work very closely with the schools. And so I think one thing we're going to start off with, at least in the beginning, is really focusing on teachers. So helping teachers understand what the reserve is, understand how to collect and use data and give them real opportunities to do that. And then, you know, just really train teachers so they can bring it into their classrooms. I think that's what we're going to start with. And we actually have a needs assessment that's out right now to try to understand what teachers are looking for to incorporate into their classrooms. So that's going to be where we start. And then I think eventually we might do programs with students. I think we'll see how that develops. I was going to say that many of the schools in Connecticut require that, you know, many of the school boards decide that at a certain grade level, they should go visit a site like Bluff Point State Park. Some school districts hire out with nature centers to deliver a program. Other schools develop their own programs. And in some cases, the teachers are left hanging in terms of, you know, well, what am I doing here at Bluff Point? That's one of those areas that we can provide information. You know, either we can go out with them or um, just providing them with the lesson plans boosts what they can do at that site. The other thing we want to do is establish in these state parks and natural area preserves, we want to establish signage but not just signs telling you about the place, uh, activities that people can do. Whether you're bringing a school group there or you're just out mountain biking at at Bluff Point State Park, there's something that you can do to contribute to citizen science, to learn about the system, QR codes that link to videos of what's under the water that you're looking at. So trying to provide those resources both in a formal way, which is reaching out to those teachers, but also in an informal way is part of what we're trying to do to get the word out to people. Of course, there are many organizations around as well. You're not the only organization. So I take it there's partnerships going on. I mean, Larissa, do you want to talk about so maybe any yes. partnerships that you have? Because those are important. I mean, and they're becoming much more important, it seems, these days. And, and for good reason. I mean, you know, everyone's got a, a different perspective on things. They've got different resources. And I suppose, you know, if you can help to, so like, coalesce them in some sort of way, it helps to get, as, as Jamie was saying, helps to get that word out there possibly a little bit quicker. Yeah, I think that is one thing our staff is all about is partnerships and collaboration. So I think we make it very clear, especially as a new organization, that we are not trying to compete with anyone. We are very much trying to work with everyone who's already established. So related to education, one thing that we've done is we put together a collaboration team, and that is a lot of different organizations in southeastern uh, Connecticut who are working on, they have their own environmental education programs. So like Mystic Seaport, Mystic Aquarium, Project O, all those groups are part of this collaboration team. And the main thing is just so we can share resources, see what one another's doing, and just making sure that we're all working together and hitting on different areas related to estuarine education. I think also So another good example of the ways we partner related to education, we also have a coastal training program coordinator, Katie, and her job is to take science and extend it to coastal decision makers so they can make the best decisions they can when it comes to managing our resources. And so Katie, through that position, has a lot of partnerships. She works with all different work groups and different types of collaboration just to make sure she's um, really extending that best available science. We 
like to live on the shoreline. We like to build on the shoreline. Yes. We like to do many different things. So it is part of that role of Katie's as well to educate them about not necessarily destroying you know natural environments or what can and cannot be done based on you know maybe zoning laws and and, and uh, etc because it that is important and of course climate change is, is playing yes, such yeah. a big role now we're seeing a lot of even our natural environments being yeah. overwhelmed because of what's happening with climate change so mm-hmm. it is is all of this part of that you know that bigger picture that bigger conversation that you guys you know have yeah so i think one nice thing about the reserve is we're very much a non-advocacy group so we're based on the science and so i think katie's role is more um again bringing that science so especially with climate change like having helping communities to make sure that they're thinking about resilience and they're planning accordingly so i think it's more bringing those tools that are you know developed to make sure that people there's so many tools out there that have been developed that communities really can use to do better planning or to do better management. So Katie's job is really to make sure that those communities have that science and those tools. I want to come back to something you said about, you know, the understanding the regulations or restrictions in the coastal zone. We're certainly available to help people navigate that. We're not necessarily the ideal organization for it. Our sister organization, Connecticut Sea Grant, also a NOAA program really focuses on helping people understand those regulations and utilize them. We often talk about uh, Sea Grant is goes out and meets people where they are, whereas as a reserve, we bring people to us. So we're bringing people to these places, and we are very place-based in what our programming will become. But I wanted to mention that you know people hear the term research reserve and immediately think, there are restrictions. I'm not allowed to do things. They're going to change how I interact at Bluff Point State Park or interact with the sound. They're going to keep me from mountain biking or horseback riding or fishing or shell fishing. And that's not at all what a reserve is. We are a research reserve, which means that through this program, we have resources which are now available to our community. We have money, we have staff, we have places where we can do programming. It brings a lot of capacity to our local communities. One of our main goals is to increase access to these places. So unlike here the term reserve, we're not reserving anything. In fact, we want to bring people to these places, give them things to do, give them information, but also bring in that access in a broader sense. So people have access to to our staff, to our knowledge, to our educational programs, in some cases to our funding, to volunteer opportunities. We are that center which helps to connect people to these coastal places. I just want to pick up on that because that's wonderful. And of course, everybody wants to be able to have access to things. But I'm guessing you also do have to educate people and make sure that they don't damage it because it's very easy to give people access and then they can, you know, accidentally start being the cause of a problem because too many people go there or because their activity that they're doing is contra to sort of like the good sort of like well-being of, of a particular area. So I'm guessing part of the education as well is to say to them, hey, yeah, come and have a look at it and then let us explain to you, you know, why this is important, how you can be so sort of like good stewards of it. Yes. Yeah, that's very true. And it is responsible access is what we're after, recognizing that there are activities that are going to damage the environment. We have a project we're hoping to get underway at Bluff Point State Park where we'll have demonstrations of things that people can do at their own properties. So how do you landscape a lawn such that it's environmentally friendly? We're hoping for some living shoreline techniques to be demonstrated at these places. Living shorelines are are just what it says. Instead of building a seawall, which is a concrete or stone structure, you're using nature-based solutions like putting in marsh grass or encouraging oyster reefs that help us protect our shoreline, but do it in a way that's good for the environment or better for the environment than a seawall. So these places, again, can be demonstrations. You know, here's here's what it looks like. If you wanna know, if you want a living shoreline along your coastal property, whether it's your town or a personal house, come and look, come and see what, what we have and the different types of shorelines, what they look like when they're installed, and hopefully encourage people to do this along the coast in both their towns, public areas, and personal homes. 
And to add on um, one thing you were talking about, Brian, with those places. So Jamie mentioned about how there's about 2,000 acres um, in the reserve that is land. And it's five different sites, and the sites are very different. So two of them that are on the Connecticut River have a little bit more sensitive habitats. They're very important for wildlife. And so we might share those places with people, but those are people places we don't really want to encourage people to access because they, they need to be protected in the sense that we need to protect that habitat and that wildlife but then there's other sites that are very much going to be open for public access recreational uses and that's like Haley Farm and Bluff Point State Park so I think the reserve as we think about it it's all so special and has an educational purpose but there's some places that are going to be reserved a little bit more for research and kind of protected because of those sensitive habitats and then some sites where it's a great place for us to work and play and be outside and really enjoy, you know, the reserve in Long Island Sound. And to explain just a little more on that, so uh, DEEP, the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, is the landowner for most of the properties that are in our reserve. They they include the two state parks, um, which Larissa just mentioned, and then two natural area preserves over on the Connecticut River. State parks, by their designation, encourage access. So people, you know, I think Bluff Point State Park is one of the most highly used state parks in the system. Haley Farm State Park is a little inland and uh, still lots of visitors to that place for biking, running, hiking, horseback riding. The natural area preserves are those by their name. They are designated by the state as areas which are reserved or preserved for um, wildlife. I'm going to put this to both of you, and, and it seems like a bit of a, a, a no-brainer sort of question, really, because I think if anyone's been paying attention to anything over the last 10, 20 years, they're going to go like, well, duh. Our attitudes have changed towards the environment. I mean, you know, the fact that we're talking to you, this brand new 30th you know, reserve in the system is that we understand we need to stop abusing our natural world and to look after it because it it has so many sort of like ramifications, not just for us, but obviously for the wildlife and everything else. Long Island Sound, which of course is the big part of, of your reserve, has changed itself. I mean, I've only been here in the US for about 14 years. And, you know, and I talk to people and they said, oh my God, you know, like years ago, Long Island Sound was just filthy and really polluted and it was really bad. It is changing, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. There's been a a huge effort on both the part of New York and Connecticut to improve the water quality in Long Island Sound. Long Island Sound Study, which is our national estuary program, are required to put out a comprehensive conservation management plan, or CCMP is what we call it. They came out with a CCMP, I want to say, in 2000, and set a goal for reducing nutrient pollution to the sound by 58% by 2017. So that was a huge effort on the part of both states. They targeted wastewater treatment plants. So wastewater treatment plants, we're humans, we excrete, we've got nutrients coming out of us, and it goes to our wastewater treatment facility. Most wastewater treatment facilities at that time, going back 20, 30 years, made the outfall from wastewater treatment facilities safe for humans. So they were removing solids, removing bacteria, but they did not remove nutrients. Nutrients don't impact us. So excess nitrogen, excess phosphorus is not going to make waters unsafe for us to swim in. You know, we are not impacted by that. But just like applying fertilizer to your lawn, when you dump a lot of nutrients into a water body, you are fertilizing the life in that system. And that's when we get blooms of seaweed. So huge amounts of seaweed growing out of control or blooms of phytoplankton, which are the microscopic plant-like organisms in the water that can make it look green or reddish or brownish when you have these huge blooms. So removing or reducing those nutrients, that nitrogen going into the water really improves the water quality. And that's the commitment that the states made. Now we made our we made the goal in 2017. We got a 58% reduction. It has had a noticeable impact on the water quality in the sound, but we still have further to go. And that's what the Long Island Sound study is doing right now along with the state partners including us evaluating what's the next step. What's our future goals for nutrient reductions? The sewer treatment plants 
were kind of low hanging fruit. They're expensive to get nutrient removal in them, but they're single locations. You know, we can go to a plant, we can upgrade it and it's easy. The harder nitrogen sources to get after are the ones that we as individuals at our homes, our apartment buildings, our parks and recreational fields, those are the ones that are harder to go after. And we call those non-point source pollution because there's not a point source. There's not literally a pipe that we can go and capture the water and fix it. We have to go to people at their home and say, okay, please reduce your fertilizer use. It's impacting water quality 20 miles down, down on the coast. Your septic tank, Again, septic tanks are designed to make water safe for humans, so they're good at removing bacteria, but all of the nutrients from our septic systems go into the groundwater, make it to our streams, and down to the coast. So upgrading those septic systems so that they are removing nutrients is an important step. And then one thing that people often don't think about is emissions from our cars and our heating oil, our, you know, our heating sources. We often talk about that as a source of carbon dioxide, carbon emissions, impacts on climate change, and we forget that it's also a nitrogen-rich source. So we're putting that nitrogen into the environment. It rains down, literally, rain carries that nitrogen down to our coastal waters and our land. So those fossil fuel emissions are also contributing nitrogen to, to our systems. One thing to talk a little bit about with um, what Jamie's talking about, about those individual, like the community members, like what you and I do and how it impacts our water quality, it's very interesting. We're part of a group that's doing a public perception survey. So if you get a phone call in the next six months, answer it, because they'll probably be asking you about how you feel about the sound. Um, But the last one they did was in 2006, and it was so interesting because they asked if people thought that community members were negatively impacting the sound and almost everybody said yes but they didn't think it was them they thought it was someone else so I think it's really important to think about how your actions do impact water quality and even if you feel like you do a really good job maybe you have like a fuel efficient vehicle or you recycle you really you know don't litter you do things that you think are helping really challenge yourself to see what you what else you can do like what's that next step that you can take because everyone does have an impact even if you're the most environmentally minded person you are still impacting the sound so i think just kind of self-reflecting and you know seeing what else we can all do well larissa and uh, jamie of the connecticut national estuarine research reserve it's been a pleasure talking to you we have just scraped the surface of what is a huge topic and we will be coming back to you uh, you know to, for, for regular updates but it is great to know that this organization which as i say is new to us and is relatively new as well is here is helping us will help to educate us, will also help to protect, obviously, the things that we hold dear and uh, and the things that we hope will be around for a very long time. And, uh, you know, science rules at the end of the day, and we need to stop ignoring it and uh, and listen and make sure that we're all good stewards of the environment around us if we want to keep it in pristine condition. So to you both, thanks ever so much for uh, giving us some insight into, as I say, the reserve. And thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for having yeah, us. Thank you. <laughs> And if you're interested in the work resources and educational opportunities of the Reserve or just want to find out more about their mission, then visit their website at estuarineresearchreserve.center.yukon.edu. We love cookies, so you are going to love the ARC's Golden Chip Giveaway. Find the Golden Chip and select the bags of the ARC Eastern Connecticut's Classic Crunch Chocolate Chip Cookies and win a free platter of cookies. Visit the ArcECT.com to find a cookie retailer near you and how eating our cookies support jobs for people with disabilities. Visit our cookie factory at 22 Route 171 in Woodstock, Connecticut. Golden Chips may be hiding in bags there too. Get buying, start winning. It's mulch season, so come and visit Green Valley Tree LLC. We have a variety of colors for all your landscaping needs. Buy as much or as little as you want. Pick it up or we can deliver to your door. Call Green Valley Tree LLC for all your mulch, plant health care, and tree service needs at 860-234-4041. We are family owned and fully licensed. 
Dreaming of a brighter future? Want to take classes but can't find the time? EastCon's adult programs offer free classes and training programs that work with even the busiest schedule. Classes are flexible and designed to support you when you are available, even if your schedule changes every week. If you want to earn your high school diploma, improve your English, prepare for American citizenship, or explore career training options, EastCon is here for you. We offer free in-person and online classes. Go to eastcon.org and click on adult and community programs. Get started today. Time now for a look at other stories making the headlines this week, sponsored by... You may think you need to travel to large medical centers to get the latest cancer clinical trials. But at Eastern Connecticut Hematology and Oncology, or ECHO, we offer dozens of leading clinical trials, matching clinical trials to the needs of our patients and getting studies opened in just days, giving our patients the latest innovation in cancer care. To learn more about our cutting-edge research, visit echoassociates.org slash trials. Connecticut College recently named its next interim president and immediately drew criticism from some of the school's faculty over the choice. The school announced that Board of Trustee member Les Wong had been unanimously voted in by the board and will take over from outgoing president Catherine Bergeron starting July 1st. In a statement from a small group of faculty who wished to remain anonymous, they said they felt betrayed and sidelined by the Board of Trustees who appointed Wong with no involvement from the faculty and used a search agency co-owned by another board of trustee member when they had clearly made their decision about Wong. Wong previously was the president of San Francisco State University and stepped down from that position after allegations of anti-Semitism on campus brought about a lawsuit that was later dismissed by a federal court and Wong also apologised to Jewish students over the situation. The change of leadership at the college has come about after current president Catherine Bergeron was forced to cancel a college fund Razor at a Florida club that's faced allegations of racism and anti Semitism and brought about the resignation of the school's former Dean of Equity and Inclusion, which prompted school wide protests by students, staff, and faculty, as well as allegations of bullying behaviour by Bergeron. Local municipal leaders from Eastern Connecticut, along with nonprofits and business leaders, heard details about how the region is going to tackle housing affordability. The event was organised by the Centre for Housing Equity and Opportunity Eastern Connecticut, a strategic partnership of seven local nonprofit organisations. Beth Sibilia is the director of the centre and said despite millions of dollars being signed into Connecticut's latest budget by the Governor for Housing, stumbling blocks at the local level in every town in the state could start Stop housing opportunities for all. But the last thing I want to see is that money to go unused because there's somebody sitting at planning and zoning saying no. And we all know that at those planning and zoning boards, the d- default answer is no. So we need to change it to a yes. Yes in my backyard, YIMBY instead of NIMBY. One of the speakers at the event was Connecticut's Deputy Commissioner for Housing, Brandon McGee, who said the state has tried to get local towns and municipalities to provide plans for future affordable housing projects, but the results have been mixed. Some of your communities have completed affordable housing plans, some have not. Some has, they've acted as if it doesn't even exist. Oh, and by the way, the department provided technical assistant dollars. For many of the communities who are saying, we just need help. We don't have the staffing. We don't understand. Okay, we can help you. Still a brick wall. Speakers at the event also highlighted racism as another factor when housing is being considered at the local level, as well as people's misunderstanding and misinformation around the use of the words affordable housing and who it's intended for. And some final news about this podcast as we turn three years old recently. And to add to that, we also won five local journalism awards in the Society of Professional Journalists Excellence in Journalism Awards for 2022. We took all three awards in the podcasting section and a second place in the education category and a third place in the health category. We'd like to say thank you to the judges and also to all of our contributors who help make those stories happen. Plus our sponsor, Green Valley Tree, our advertisers and of course the Hall Communication Group for broadcasting this podcast each week on their six Eastern Connecticut radio stations.
That's all from us for this edition. Do send us your questions and story ideas to the show via our website at Connecticut-East.com or Facebook or Twitter at Connecticut East and on Instagram at Connecticut East This Week. And you can listen to the show again on our social platforms on demand and by asking your smart speaker to play Connecticut East This Week podcast. And please like, follow and share on your social media too. I'm Brian Scott Smith. Thank you for listening. (laughs) 